Well, church, we've got a quick series, this series. We've only got three weeks. Last week, we looked at master. This week, we're looking at mates. And next week, we're looking at mission. So last week, quick sort of background. I know a lot of you weren't here last week. We talked about how Jesus is our master. And I also shared a little bit in service evening how I recoil against that idea. I don't want anyone to be my master. No one is my boss. I don't want anyone to be my boss. You're not the boss of me, is what my heart wants to say. I started my own business because I didn't want anyone to be the boss of me. You can't tell me what to do. I'm going to do my thing. (laughs) That even stems into my work and my career, that thing in me, which I don't know where it comes from, this sort of rebellious streak, that I don't want anyone to be the boss of me. Even to the point where if someone tells me, hey, when you're doing something, do it like this, I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to figure out how I want to do it. (laughs) I want to be, I'm a pretty stuffed up person, right? I'm just, you can all see that, that the the brokenness, the broken part of me. I want to be the commander of my universe and the captain of my soul. But in reality, the gospel says that life doesn't work very well like that and the master that we talked about last week the reason that it's awesome the gospel message is awesome is because jesus is awesome and if i can submit to anyone it's a god who would come from heaven and he would come down like us the god the person who made everything and he would die so that i could be right with him and actually live a life that's worth living i think i know what's best and i want to be the boss of things when i do that doesn't go very well. God created us in his, in his image. He designed a way for us to live. We, we wouldn't just have joy. We would thrive in the way that God designed us to live. And that's a master that I can, I can submit to. I have to fight, about, fight for it. I still have to remind myself. I need all of you to remind me to do that because I don't want to. But he's such a good and loving God that I can do that because of who he is. Louis, last week, at the end of his sermon, he he gave us six questions when we're reading the Bible, when we're learning about our master, that are a really helpful way to read the Bible and consider it from a God-centered perspective. So the first question that we can come and ask ask the text is, first is, what what is the context? Make sure we're not reading something into the Bible that's not there. But then secondly, who is God? Who are we learning about who God is by reading the Bible? If you missed last week's sermon, it was awesome. I'd encourage you to go and listen. I won't rehash it all. Now, otherwise, we're going to be here for an hour. (laughs) But building on that, on the idea of master, we're now going into mates or community. With God as our master, as the head or the the dad, the boss of our, the way that we live, then how do we all live in community with each other? First, I, I think when we talk about community and living together, I think it's really interesting to consider... I'm a bit of a demographic, kind of cultural nerd. Maybe I should have studied something along that line. I didn't. I studied economics. Oh, I'm not in the camera. I should stay over here, I guess. You said you'd follow me, Louis. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's okay. I'll just stay here. (laughs) Um, So Western countries, there's some really interesting research and analysis on different cultures and what makes them tick. There's a guy called Hostfeed. Host. Yeah. Hoff. I can't say it's a German name. Host. I'm going to stop. Hosted, that's that's what I'm looking for. He's done some really interesting research on cultures. He's got six kind of ways of comparing the different cultures around the world and what makes them tick. Um, It's worth, if that gets you out of bed, it's really interesting to read. But Australia, along with the United States and the UK, is off the charts in in individualism. That compared to all the other countries around the world that are much more sort of collective and, think, and people think about themselves as part of a community and they want to think about themselves that way. Australia, in particular, off the charts, that, you know, we, we are individuals. Basically what that means is, it, is, it, is that we expect to look after ourselves, we expect to look after our direct family members, and that's it. We don't have any sort of you know, broader sense of collectivism that defines who we are and that we feel an obligation to. We're a highly individualistic culture. But at the same time, 
as that, that being in all sorts of research. We as people, as humans, all people, regardless of where they're from, we want and we need community and connection. So much advertising, I reckon, appeals to this, you know, about community and connection. The new estates that are around here, so many of them appeal to our sense of community. Come and live in you know, the key estate and have participated in such an awesome community. Or the new Warralili estate, or there's so many new ones, I can't keep up with them. But a common thread is community, you know. Come and be part of our community and be known here. Also, sports clubs do the same thing. Be a member. Be a member of a sports club and participate in our community. Even like brands, you know, be part of the Rip Curl community and be a loyal member. And there's this community that you can participate in and feel known from. There's something that these brands appeal to, um, this idea that we want to belong to something, even as simple as a um, T-shirt. But as Australians, I think we want a community that's close, but not too close. It's there when we want it and we need to kind of hang out with someone or chat. But we don't want community generally that knows our junk. It's like, you're there and when, you, when I sort of need you, I can call you and we can go, you know, we go and have a coffee and hang out. But we don't really want community of these people that are in our lives and know the good, the bad and the ugly of who we are. All those things though that I mentioned, you know, sports clubs, new estates, brands, Employers and co-working spaces are a big thing, too. They're all communities that form around something that we have in common, right? There's a common interest, maybe, a common location, common sort of uh, appeal to fashion or whatever it is. There's something that's in common that draws that bunch of people together. In the word community, or communion, where the word sort of comes from, if you break it up, you think about common unity. There's something in common that causes unity, that brings those people together. In these communities that we talk about and brands appeal to us from though, when that common thing goes, you know, we might move house, we might, if we're part of a Nissan car club, now we buy a Ford, we can't be part of the Nissan car club, maybe you can, I don't know about car clubs, but it would feel weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, when that thing goes that brings us together, the community goes as well. But God's design, for community is different. Our master's design for community is different than that. It's better than that. It's way better than that. It's so different, I think, for Australians that it's actually really countercultural now, this idea of community that God is calling us to. So today, this is a long introduction, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I want to kind of fly through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, early church, kind of have a really quick look at what community looks like from that perspective and then go, what does that mean for us today? What, what, given what's in the Bible, this kind of broad brush sweep of community in the Bible, what does it mean for us practically, to, practically today? I'm going to touch on things that you might feel like I um, don't explain very well or kind of leave hanging and I assume some things are right in what I'm saying and that's true um, because I don't want to talk for too long. But if there's something in like the, my description of community in who God is or in the Old Testament or the New Testament that you'd like to explore more or ask about why I made that assumption, then I'm, I'd love to chat with you afterwards as well. I'm, maybe I'm trying to achieve too much. I've never done this before. If I am, I'm sorry. I'm going to give it a go there. Let's go. So first community, gospel community that I want to look at is who God is. How many parts are there to our God? There's, there's three parts. Right? Our God is not an individual, an individualistic God. Our God, there's three parts to one God. Our God lives and exists in community, in the most perfect common unity that there is. One God, three parts. In Genesis 1, when you know, God has finished making the world, making all the stuff in it, God refers to himself and he says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. It's not let me, it's let us. Let us work together to make man in our likeness and image. So kind of the foundation, the person who made all of this exists in community. 
In creation, we just referred to creation when God created things. We see that it's not good. God first makes Adam. It's, and, and it doesn't take very long that Adam goes, hey, I'm kind of lonely here. These animals are cool, but I need someone to chat to. I need someone that I can be closer to than all of these awesome animals. And God created Eve as a partnership from which families come. And it's through the family of Abraham, just not very long after, actually the long time elapsed, but in reading through Genesis, it's not very long. It's through the family of Abraham that God reveals himself to the world. Abraham's family, they lived as a massive big family, a nation through which all other nations would see God work through the way that they lived together and, and could be drawn to God. Genesis 12, it says, Now God said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I'll show you, and I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great, so that you'll be a blessing. It's through Abraham's family, through the nation, through the community, that all nations, the whole world, would be blessed. And all through the Old Testament, we see it's through the whole community of Israel that God works, through the whole, all of the 12 tribes of Israel that God works. It's not through, yes, there's leaders. Of course, there's leaders that we, you know, there's Moses and Ezra who we looked at recently and Nehemiah. It's made up of stories of individuals, but the, the collective of Israel is treated as a community throughout the text of the Old, the, the text of the Old Testament. The community of Israel, they obey God together and they're blessed through David and Solomon. They disobey God together. You know, there's a series of bad kings and they all go into exile together. The text doesn't say this family was good and that one was no good and this guy was all right and that one wasn't. It's all of them. They're all bundled together. There's this big community that we read about and that God explains himself and we can learn who God is and who people are, unfortunately, um, through the text of the Old Testament. They're blessed together and they all go into exile together. God doesn't address Israel as individuals. He, dre he addresses them and works in and through them as a community. It's made up of 12 tribes and the 12 sons of Jacob that we can kind of read about and understand that community. The New Testament comes along and instead of Jesus, and, and, you know, we kind of, instead of this big community of Israel, 12 tribes, Jesus creates a community of 12 disciples. 12 people. Just like God chose Abraham that we read about before, Jesus chose his disciples. Jesus didn't come to just work on his own, just to be one person. We learn so much by looking at and understanding who Jesus is, but we learn about it through his interactions with people and this community of people that he, he, he chose and made around himself. He created a community to live among, to train, to teach and to work. And the disciples, I'd love to just kind of spend more time looking at and explaining who the disciples were. But they were a real diverse set of people. Now, we talked about the common unity that you can have by living in Warralilly Estate or by wearing rip curl clothes or by driving Nissans. These dudes, they, had, they didn't have that. <laughs> there was Levi. Where's my Levi? There he is. Levi loves reading about Levi or Matthew in the Bible. He was a tax collector, right? So in the time of Jesus, Israel was under Roman rule. And this guy, he went to all of the Israelites, collected the money from them, kept some from himself and gave it back to Rome. He was working with the regime, you know. Some, some Jews wanted re revolution. It's like, we can't be working with these. These are the bad dudes. We can't be sort of helping and supporting them. That's not what Matthew thought, clearly, or Levi thought. He's like, well, we're here. I'm going to make the best of a bad situation. Maybe in my interactions with the regime, I can show, I can bless them, I can love them. Hey, Mima. Um, he was one of Jesus' disciples. They also, though, so in the same group of 12 people were James and John, sons of thunder. If, if Matthew, let's just put him, this maybe isn't fair, we just did left and right series, let's put him on the left-hand side of politics, right? James and John, and maybe this also isn't fair, they're on the right, they're way right. There's a story in Luke where Jesus and his disciples were traveling to Jerusalem and they're going through Samaria and the Samaritans and the, 
people in Jerusalem didn't like each other. So people kind of run ahead of Jesus. They're going through Samaria and say, hey, Jesus is coming. Is there, can you get a spot ready for him where we can stay for the night? And they're like, oh, where are you going? Like, oh, we're going to Jerusalem. I'm like, oh, Jerusalem. Oh, no, nah. no, nah, we're not helping you. And so James and John, they like, they say to Jesus, hey, let's call down fire from heaven and burn those dudes. <laughs> they're not working with the regime. They're like, oh, those dudes aren't helping. Let's burn them. Let's burn them, Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus is like, no, no, that's, that's not what we're here for. We're not burning dudes. That's not what we're up to. All of these people are thrown together. They're, those two kind of left and right, they're in Jesus' crew, in this community that Jesus creates in his disciples. Jesus also, in thinking about Jesus and community, he also ate with people, hey? Like when we read through a gospel, pick the gospel of Luke, there's so many times where Jesus is eating with people. He's having meals with people. He's hanging out. He's in their homes. And it's pretty controversial, the people that he eats with. So often people are kind of going, oh, why are you having dinner with that guy? Why are you going to Zacchaeus' house? Don't, don't be hanging out with him. But Jesus hangs out. He has communion with all sorts of people through the Bible, through, through the Gospels and through his life. He did it so often that you could almost think that maybe that's just what Jesus did. He just kind of went, he hung out, he had a group of people and he hung out with people and ate meals in their houses. He did so much of it. It was such a big part of his ministry. And as we continue to fly through, as we look at Acts, the early church community in Acts 2, that was a radical community to be part of. And I think, and so many, there's a lot of books written on community in, the, you know, in Christianity and um, how we can live as a community. And the kind of the key text that so many um, of these books refer to is from Acts chapter 2, from verse 42. Sets, this sets such a great example for us to look at and apply to us today. So I'll just read that. It's from Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, And they, this is talking about the early church believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together. They had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and their belongings, and they were distributing the proceeds to all, as any of them had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favour with all of the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That sounds like a pretty cool community to be part of, right? There's a lot going on in there. You, we could spend weeks. We've only got one week. And I'm already halfway through, but you could break that down and go, what exactly are they doing? And how can we kind of model our lives around that? I kind of want to spend now the next 10 or 15 minutes considering that. I'm going to make a bit of a jump from that text and from what we've kind of, you know, been reading through from who God is right through to the early church to then jump and go, well, for us today, specifically us on the surf coast, I guess, given that that's the context that we're here. What might that look like? And gospel communities, this, this first bit is true everywhere. I'll then dive into, into Surf Coast. But what is our common union as a group of people here sitting on the dirt on, in Mount Dunedin? Some of you are sitting on this nice astro turf. It's that we are family. We are children of God. Galatians chapter 3 says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. As many of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew or Greek or slave or free. There's no male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. You're heirs according to the promise. That's right back to that Old Testament that we were looking at. We're part of that same family through what Jesus has done. If we're family, 
The next question then is how are we to live as part of this family? And the passage that Tash read out from us in Colossians um, kind of is a really, there's, there's heaps in that too. But I'll read a little bit of it again from Colossians 3 verse 12. How are we to live? We're in God's family. What does it mean? Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if someone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As God has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all of these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The bond that we have in Jesus is stronger than the bond, I reckon, that we have as bio, in it with our biological family. We have so much in common through what, who Jesus is and what he's done that he calls us to a radical way of living in community with each other. So what does that mean for our gospel community? We refer to them as GCs. A bunch of you guys are in gospel communities and part of gospel communities. If all of this kind of big, broad brush of, that I've kind of flown through is true about community, what does it mean for how we live in community with each other? And in our church, gospel community is kind of the way that we break that down from a big, you know, this is also awesome to be all together on a Sunday, but at a kind of smaller layer where we can really know each other, what does it mean? I think maybe it's helpful to first talk about two things that I reckon gospel communities aren't as a result of all of this. Do you want to move it? Or why? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The first thing that I reckon it means our gospel communities aren't is that they're not something that happens on a Wednesday night or a Tuesday night or whenever your gospel community might meet. Our gospel communities are not something that just happens once that maybe if you're not too tired, you drag yourself along to once a week. That is not what our gospel communities are. That community that we just read about in Acts, they didn't say, oh yeah, next Wednesday I'll see you. That's not what they did. They were living in tight community with each other. They were right in the thick of each other's lives. They were selling what they've got. It's like, hey, Simon, you know, he doesn't have something that he needs. I'm going to sell my thing so Simon can have that. That's not just hanging out for dinner once, you know, once a week on a Wednesday night. Our gospel communities, I think, are something that needs to be a big part of our life. It's something that our life revolves around. If we are family with each other, and gospel communities are the way that we break that down in our church, that's something that our life needs to revolve around. It's not something that we just squeeze in once a week. In order for us to do community well in this way, we need to know each other. We need to know the good, the bad, and the ugly of each other, just like you do with your biological family. And we can do that because we have a common unity in Jesus that is unwavering and unchanging. It's the unconditional love and acceptance of Jesus. It's that love that brings us together. And because of our understanding of that love that he has for us, we can demonstrate that same love to each other. In our really individualistic society, it can be really hard for us to do that, for us to want to open up our lives and our world to other people, to let other people in, for let, let them to see the good. The good's okay, that's on Instagram. The bad and the ugly, we don't put on Instagram, right? But we don't want other people to see that. We don't want to show weakness, we worry that if people really know who I am, then they won't want me in their community. They won't love me, they won't accept me. But church, we can be just like Jesus' disciples. We can be so different, but so connected because of who Jesus is. It transforms our relationships and the community that we can be part of. We want our gospel communities to be a place where you can be known and loved and accepted. And that can't happen one night a week. It's got to be more than that. The second thing that this means, I reckon, that our Bible study, that our gospel communities aren't, is they're not primarily a Bible study. 
Reading and talking about and applying the Bible is something that we will do as part of gospel community. We want to know who our master is, like we talked about last week. But that's not our only goal. Our gospel communities aren't something that we just do once a week and they're not just a Bible study. This community that we're reading about is not just someone that... They don't just come once a week and read the Bible together. It's so much more than that. And so what is it then? If there are two things that it's not, what is our gospel community about? In our gospel communities, we want to understand who God is through the Bible. We want to understand and really know each other in community so that we can help each other to be more like Jesus. That's where we want our gospel communities to be. They're based on who our master is, but they're worked out in knowing each other and participating and living in community with a goal so that we can all become and help each other become more like Jesus. As we've seen, God works through groups of people. He doesn't work on us as little islands and individuals. And we want him to work through us. And the way that he does this by design is through other people, through each other. There's so many passages in the Bible that talk about doing things to one another, you know. A few, a few of these, just rapid fire, you know, love one another. There's, a, there's like 16 or 18 times that we're called to love one another. Be devoted to one another. Honour one another above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another. Build up one another. We can't do these things on our own. We have to be living in community to be working out the gospel in our lives. We want to point each other to Jesus in our gospel communities. And in order to do this, we need to know each other. Not just the good, not just the Instagram parts, but the bad and the ugly too. And we can do this because of God's unconditional love and acceptance to and for us. That's how come, that's how it's possible for us to do that. I need people in my life, I shared at the start how I want to be the boss of my world. Every day I wake up and that's in me. What am I going to be the boss of today? I need people that know that about me, not just at this level that I'm talking about here, but no one can see how that works out in the way that I live, in the way that I interact with people, and can say to me and ask me, hey, how, how is Jesus, how are you submitting to Jesus in your life this week? I need people that know that about me and can do that. You all need that too. Maybe not in the same way, <laughs> but there is something in all of us that we need to be reminded of and brought back to. Some awesome truth about how, God, how good God is that we can only do in a group and a community of people. And so the practical, I guess, getting really practical, what might that look like for us? What are some ideas for our gospel communities and ways that we might be able to work that out? I've got a whole bunch of them. Maybe some of these won't work in your GC. Maybe some of them will. My GC, get ready, we're going to be doing some of this stuff. <laughs> the first way, I reckon, is a really good thing to do in your gospel communities, is to tell your story. In order to know each other, we need to give each other time and hear to, and understand who each other are. Take it in turns. One week, we all rock up, there's 10 people, say, in our GC. It's my turn. I'm going to tell my story. Where I grew up, what was, I, what was I like at school? What did I like or hate at school? Did I do good at school or not? What did I choose to do afterwards and why? Who is my family and the people that I live with and why? Or who do I not live with and why? Who is Jesus to me? Where did I meet him? Or maybe I haven't met him. And what, what significance does that have in my life? What are the things that I struggle with and the things that I keep doing that I just wish I didn't do? In your gospel communities, take it in turns. One person a week, perhaps. Let them just ask questions. Share. Be known in your gospel communities so that that whole group of people that your life can start to revolve around can speak Jesus' gospel truth specifically to your situation and do that for each other. Celebrate together. If your family, birthdays, Maybe some families don't do it. Birthdays are a thing in my family. 
When Geelong's in the grand final. That's awesome. <laughs> Catch up, watch the grand final together. When there's public holidays, go away camping together. Celebrate things together. Eat together. We have, if there's three, you know, seven days a week, three meals a day, maybe some of you had more, I think I have more than that. Maybe some of you had less than that. But assuming that you have three, there's 21 meals a week that we have that everyone's gonna do anyway. You're gonna eat, you have to eat. Maybe you can skip one. We have one of these, probably a fortnight shared is the rhythm in a lot of our gospel communities. That means out of 42 meals, we're having one together. Share more, go to each other's homes. These dinners, they don't have to be flash, just do what you normally do. If you would normally get fish and chips on a Friday night, then just get fish and chips. If you'd get, no, don't, don't get KFC, KFC is really bad for you. But whatever you would normally do, just do that and invite other people from your gospel community in. Play together. We all do things to relax and let our hair down, for those of us that have hair. <laughs> But invite other people in. If you like surfing, invite someone that's never surfed. Go surfing. If you like bushwalking, invite someone along. The things that you do to play and to recreate, share them with each other. Play together. Help each other. There's always things that we can help each other with. Pick up the kids from school. Lend people your car. Share what you have. I think we have this thing, I know that I do, that we'll ask our biological family for a certain type of help that we won't ask other people. We have this connection with our biological family, which is understandable, where, oh, this, you know, my kids are sick. They've vomited all over the carpet. Mum, can you come help me? Well, that's awesome. But ring up someone in your gospel community too. You know, Kirby. <laughs> my kids are sick. I'm sick. Can you come and help me, please? Do it. Ask each other for help. Live in community in a real way. Do it for each other. Our bond in Jesus is stronger than the bond that we can have with our biological family because of the common unity that we have in how good Jesus is. And hang out with each other. We don't have space for very many people to be close in our lives. You know, most people can have a handful of good friends. We just don't have very much more time and space in our lives than that. Make space for the people in your gospel community to hang out with. Doesn't all of that sound awesome, if we can do that? That's a community that I, and I reckon many others, want to be part of. Next week, we're going to look at mission. The mission that God has given us all, and the mission that God has given us as a group of people, as gospel communities and as a big group of people here. If we can live in community like that, it's awesome for us, but those, those communities aren't just for us. Better draw people in and to invite people. They're not closed communities. We want more. We want all of Armstrong Creek and Torquay to be living and experiencing how good a community like that can be and see who Jesus is by how we can work out and live and love each other. I'd love to talk with any of you more about you know, kind of the practical outworkings of that. But in your gospel communities this week when you meet on Wednesday nights, hopefully that's not the only time that you meet and hang out with each other. I'd love for you to consider what that means. What might that look like for you? What do you think I've said that makes sense and you can apply? What do you think I'm crazy about? And Oh, that'll never work. Talk about it. Work it out. Um, see how we can live as a radical and countercultural community. And next week, come back to hear about the mission that those communities have that are not just inward focused, but outward focused. Let me pray. And I'll invite Natasha back up after that. I thank you, God, for how good you are.